sometimes when I walk up here and they're playing, I feel like the host of the Tonight Show. You know, he comes out and it's got the music playing. It's so good to see you today. Uh, I, I really want to encourage you to be here this Wednesday. Um, it's going to be an incredible time. Kids Blitz is going to be an amazing. We do this because we are prioritizing young families. We want to, we know, research tells us, we see, we're living that if children accept Christ, that their lives are completely different. And so we're trying to make this a priority. I hope that you will come if you uh, have children. It is an event that you make memories with your child. It's not one of those you drop them off and go to Target. And um, it, you make memories with them. If you're a grandparent, we would love for you to have it. And, uh, to come and, and if you want to invite some kids to be with you, this is a great invite opportunity. It really is an incredible time. So I want to encourage you to be here this Wednesday at 630. Um, particularly, Kayla and I are so committed to kids ministry and to growing this church, we are actually going to have a third baby. So how about that? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we're going to have a third baby, and um, people say to me, they say, wow, you must love kids, three. I said, no, I love my wife. <laughs> That's the problem. So, um, but nonetheless, we love kids on the back end. So anyways, but we are, uh, we're thrilled, and, and I want you to know we're committed to growing this church. So it's good to be with you today. Today I want to continue our series called I Am Gideon. This idea that in the Bible we find characters and we find passages and these, these stories and, and these moments that, that help us know that we are not living circumstances that no one else has had to deal with. That's one of the biggest lies of the enemy, that the uniqueness, the thing going on in your life, you're the only person that's ever had to deal with it. But what the truth is, is that God's word is a place that we can constantly find ourselves. We can find ourselves in every moment, in every story. And so um, I, I'm really looking forward as we continue to look at Gideon and what all's going on in his life. If you remember from last week, Gideon was not exactly the mighty warrior God said that he was. He was found as this wimp in the wine press, and he's hiding out and blaming everyone else and blaming even God, and his pit experience has given him a pitiful outlook on life. But God begins to call Gideon for not who he was at the moment, but for who God saw him, who God saw him as in the future. And it's so awesome that God continues to do that with us. And today we're just going to continue right in with Gideon because there are still some incredible truths that we can pull out from his life that will apply that if you're in that place that you've just taken these steps, you too can see God's plan unvolving and just revolving in your life. So if you want to turn with me to Judges chapter 6, we're going to continue there. Um, how many of you have ever had to sell a house? He had to sell a house, many of us. Kayla and I have had to, unfortunately, sell our share of homes. And there's one thing that no matter how many realtors we've experienced, they all say the same thing. Location, location, location. Location is everything. I particularly love when the realtor says to you, if your house was located in such and such a place, it would sell for twice as much. To which I think, I don't say, I think, boy, that's helpful. You know, why don't I check into that? You know, and then I think to myself, maybe you should relocate yourself near some buyers instead of giving me things that aren't going to be that helpful to me. But nonetheless, location is everything in our lives. The location of where our marriages are figuratively, the location where we are spiritually, the location of our careers all typically matters a whole lot when it comes to the quality of our life. And, and, and that's all well and good, but what happens in life when you can't stand your current location? What happens when you're just, you're, you're sick of your current location? You just, you know there's more, but you don't see it yet. What happens when you, you just, I just don't like where life is located right now. You've bought into God's plan for your life. You've bought into that he has a promised destiny. But the problem is that promised destiny doesn't match your present destination. 
And so what do you do in these moments when you have this? Gideon finds himself in a similar state. He finds himself in this place to where he has gotten himself enough faith to crawl out of the wine press. God's pep talked him enough that he, he believes that, that God has a plan for his life. And he gets out of this, this pit and he, and he starts to, to, to walk out what God has for his life. And he starts to think Wow, if God says I can do it, maybe I can. If God says that these things are going to happen, then they, they must be going to. And he starts to think, I, I would imagine he starts to think about what his family would look like under, outside of the oppression and what a harvest would look like again when it came into his life. And he starts to think through a free nation and life as this mighty warrior that God says that he's going to be. And it's just he's starting to build it up except for there's a problem. His location. You see, in the current location that Gideon is in, God did give him a plan. And God has spoken into his life, but no one else believes there is a destiny at this point. You see, at this place, Gideon, his family is actually bound in some real issues. And Gideon, at this point, has no one on his side, and the enemy is still very present in his life. And so for Gideon, although he believes in all this that's taking place and he believes in the promise of this big destiny, he has seen no big change in his circumstances. So what do you do in those things? Could it be that small things lead to big faith? Could it be that God is actually sitting back and watching Gideon and saying, perhaps the circumstance, even though my great destiny is in you, I want to see how you'll do in a situation that's still not that great. Boy, if I lived there, I mean, I, I remember just believing in God's plan for my life and, and really just having this moment where I, I knew God had called me into ministry and he had put a dream and a desire in my heart. And so then eventually some opportunities came available and I started to serve on a staff and I just was believing for God's biggest and best. And then I hit one of the toughest ministry seasons I've ever been in in my life. The church I was in went into a steep decline over issues that were happening in the body. And friends and staff members that I served with were leaving rapidly. And, and it's just, I thought that my whole purpose had been derailed because of the location I was in at that moment. And looking back on that moment, just like you, if you looked back on a moment that was similar, I saw that, that God didn't so much derail me as he did undergird me in those moments. He actually used those moments to make me the man that he needed me to be. You know what? God never wastes a season, circumstance, or location in your life. He never wastes a single one. The, if the location that you're in now that you despise, the one that you just wish would pass, and God's going to use that. God's going to use it for his good. He's developing in you what he needs to have happen through the location you're in. And for Gideon, you and I, in this moment that we, we don't seem like our location matches our, our future destination, in this location that we despise and we don't want to be a part of, there are some small things that still matter, small things that build big faith. And so today I want us to look into Gideon's life because in this location, but with the call of this big destiny, there are some small steps that lead to his big destiny. Some small things that really matter that we can easily overlook. See, Gideon's now pulled himself out of the wine press and he's got a pep in his step and he's walking with faith. He's believing what God has said about him and he's ready to go. I mean, we're only moments after he and God have had the conversations that we talked about last week. And so God, seeing that Gideon has some pep in his step, he takes and gives Gideon his first mission. Remember, Gideon's destiny is to be a, a, to, to be a judge and to oversee the whole nation's restoration back to God. And so God God starts out with mission number one in verse 25. Let's pick up there. That same night, Judges 6, 25, that same night the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Wait just a minute. 
Wait just a minute. I thought I was going to overthrow the Midianites. I thought that I was going to free a people of oppression. I thought that I was going to be a big deal. This was a big destiny. And your first mission for me is to go back to a place that everybody knows me. To go back to the village that I grew up in. To go back to a location that I can't wait to get out of. Your, your plan is for me to go back to the people who see me as the wimp in the wine press instead of the mighty warrior you say I am. That's your plan. Sound familiar? <laughs> God, we just had this awesome morning together in devotions. And you want me to go back and talk to her? I, God, you know I loathe her. God, we just had this amazing worship service. And you want me to go back and invest in that relationship? God, I sense your calling on my life. And you want me to go back to this job site. This one I despise. What happens when the location just doesn't match your expectation for where God wants to put you in your life? You see, this reaction is the most, one of the most common stops on our journey of faith. It is. It's one of the most common. Every person in this room, as you follow God, will have to go through a season to where you sense God's big destiny on your life only to realize he's directing you back to a place that you do not prefer. All of us have to have those moments to where we sense what God wants to do and we know and it's, it's in, in our hearts and in our minds, but it looks nothing like what's around us and who's around us. And so at this moment, God is sending him back. And here's the reason why God is doing this. He wants to make sure that Gideon can remain faithful and fruitful no matter the circumstances. He wants to make sure that no matter the location that Gideon's in, that he will remain faithful and fruitful. God's development for us always reduces our dependence on circumstances while raising our dependence on him. His circumstances always control the idea that he wants us to forget about what's around us and concentrate on who's for us. That's what God's doing in Gideon's life. He's saying, Gideon, you're going to, to set free a nation. You're going to make a difference. I, but I need you to start in the location that you, you just hate. I need you to start in this place. And so there's some small things that Gideon does on the way to his big destiny that I want to look at today because chances are you are going to have to do these same small things. In verse 25, it says, That same night the Lord said to him, You know what? That means there was no delay in God's instruction. I mean, he gets out of the wine press, has this moment with God, and then immediately God sends him to this location that he doesn't want to be. And what this whole point is about is, Gideon, I want you to learn to serve where you are. To serve where you are. You see, there are two attitudes immediately that we see out of Gideon's life that God had to use as prerequisites to be able to use Gideon in something in the future. And the first one is quick obedience. Quick obedience. Notice this, that same night, there's not a couple days between, there's not a moment. It's get out of the wine press, dust yourself off, and move in what I tell you to do. And Gideon does it. You see, Gideon left no time between what God said and what he did. He left no time in, the, in the, this moment because here's the truth of what Gideon knows. Delay leads to doubt, and doubt leads to disobedience. Delay leads to doubt, and doubt leads to disobedience. He knew that if he gave himself enough time, he would find a reason not to follow through with what God said to him. Boy, do I, this is so true in my life. You know, there, it, it, contrary to popular belief, there are still moments in my life that I mess up. And in these moments that I mess up, then, then there is always this, this need to apologize, right? I mean, that's just something we're, the Holy Spirit asks us to do, to keep the unity and the bond of peace. I mean, he wants us to see us do that. But man, if I'm not quick to do that, do you know what I've found? That even when I'm wrong, if I give myself enough time, I'll justify what I did. Yeah. 
Does anybody else do that? Even when I'm wrong, I will give myself enough time to justify what I did, which ultimately leads to bitterness, pride, and offense in the relationships around me. The quicker that when I mess up, the quicker that I apologize, the better my life is. Not only because I've been obedient, but because the relationships around me end in harmony. So Gideon knows that this delay in his life, if he gives it any moment, it's going to create a doubt uh, to, what, with, to what God said. And then he'll, he'll live a life in disobedience. But it wasn't only his quick obedience that God loved. It was his quality service. You see, I know we talked a lot about last week that Gideon is hiding in a wine press and he's threshing wheat and that should have been up on a hillside. But what you can't miss in that is that Gideon is faithful to thresh wheat. Even in a place and in a moment and with a way that is not easy, in a, in, in a place that it's not the best circumstances for it, he's still focused on being fruitful in his life. And God sees that. And then notice that before God gives him his big destiny to overthrow a nation, that he takes Gideon and says, tear down your father's idols and build me. He, God is laying out these small circumstances, these small things that he's waiting for Gideon to do as he's developing his big destiny. God is saying he wants to see how Gideon handles this location that he's in. Does he still give it his all? Does he still make sure that he's obedient to God even though he doesn't care about it, even though it makes no difference seemingly whether he does it right or not? God loves this about Gideon. He loves everything about it. You see, God noticed this pattern in Gideon. Gideon didn't know how these small assignments would lead to a big destiny, but God did. You see, Gideon didn't have any clue how the things around him and, and doing what appeared to be just normal mundane things mattered, but God did. God, there, there are things in your life that you do each and every day that you think have nothing to do with your destiny, but God knows they do. And he watches to see how we do them and when we do them and with what attitude we do them because they're the things that he's looking upon our heart to see if we can be a part of the greater things he desires for us. God will often use lesser circumstances and lesser tasks before he gives you your greatest calling. He's often going to use the small things that you think don't matter before he gives you the greatest things that do. Gideon is faithful in these moments, and later he conquers kingdoms. And it's because God looks for someone, no matter the location, who's faithful to doing for him when they don't feel like it. You see, it's often the small things no one sees that result in the big things everyone wants. You know that's true, right? It's the small things no one sees that result in the big things everyone wants. Everybody wants a great marriage. But they don't see the small things you do to have that great marriage. Everybody wants uh, that retirement. But they don't see the things that you sacrifice to have that retirement. See, it's the small things that God looks at. It's never these large, huge things that we all look at. It's always these small attitudes. See, I, I knew a guy one time that, that was really a man of God, full of Scripture. Everything he said, you could see it being filtered through the Bible. And, and I assumed that he had to have been a seminary professor, a Hebrew scholar, or there was some big commitment in his life. And so one day I asked him, I said, how do you know so much? How, how did you become what God uh, is doing? How does that Scripture overflow out? Of your heart, expecting him to say, Well, I dedicated my whole life and I lived in Israel for X amount of years. And you know, here's what he said He said, Several years ago, I started reading the Bible through every year. And it only takes about 15 minutes a day. And up to this point, I've read it through probably 16, 17 times. A small daily discipline led to the life that I desired. What I thought was a huge, big thing in his life. Turned out it was a small discipline in his life. The small things in front of you today will absolutely determine the big things that you have in your destiny. The small things with which you do, the attitude with which you do them, the excellence with which you do them, absolutely will come and appear in your life tomorrow in equal quality. And here's the thing you should know. There is no such thing as a small decision. 
Every day you have decisions on what you look at and what you think about and how, which, which, what level you do things. There's no such thing as small decisions because every decision affects the destiny that God has for you. Gideon, I thank goodness you were faithful even in a wine press to thresh wheat. Thank goodness that you didn't blow past this moment that you could have just said, God, I'm here for a nation, not for my dad's house. Because it was in this moment that God found you and saw you, and he saw what he needed to give you the greatest destiny you're ever going to have. But it doesn't start there. You serve where you are, but you also start where you are. So many of us, we want to start somewhere else, don't we? I'll just change jobs again. I'll just get another wife. You know, I mean, it's just easier to start over than it is to see it through, isn't it? And so Gideon, you, you can't, you know, I know I'm sending you back to the same village and the same people and the same frustrations, but Gideon, the people who have the destiny that I want for them, they start where they are. Verse 25 continues to say that not only did you move quickly, but it says, tear down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. His first assignment is to tear down his father's idols. You see, Israel at this point had not, um, ha had not abandoned God completely. They didn't worship idols only. They combined worship of idols with God. Yes. Wow. Yes. It's not that they had forsaken God, it's just they had added to him. And, and Gideon's father actually is the keeper of the shrines. And so the first thing that God wants Gideon to see is this idea that you, Gideon, have to get the enemies among you away before you can get the enemies around you away. You, you see, Gideon was focused on the ones around him, the Midianites, that lady across the cubicle, the, the neighbor. That's what Gideon, and God's saying the whole time, I need you to pay attention to the idols among you before you ever worry about helping someone else with their idols. And, and so Gideon's work follows this pattern that every person who's ever got to be used by God follows. He starts at home and moves outward yes. towards other people. It's the exact same pattern that God requires of any person that he's ever wanted to use. And man, is it the step that we would love to skip. And man, is this not the one? I mean, I would any day of the week work with a complete stranger than somebody close to me. When it comes to really removing stuff from our lives. I would any day take someone off the street. I mean, as a matter of fact, you've probably found yourself, it's easier to give grace to people who, who you just meet one time than it is to someone you really know them, is it not? And so in these moments... Gideon is saying, oh, God, not back there. Are you sure? I, I, my dad's, I mean, I'll take his neighbor. I'll take, I'll take that guy I don't know. I mean, I know that there's that one guy across the way. No, I want you to go and start by cleaning up your own house. See, the crazy thing is, is that God knew he would call Gideon in this valley, in this tribe, and in this family. God, in his perfect wisdom, knew and called Gideon at a moment that he could have the greatest impact on his family. It's incredible to think that he could have called him across the village, but he calls him at close. I mean, they're close enough that his, this, this bull is within you know, reach. I mean, he knew Gideon would be at home when he called him. And so there are, there are just these questions for me of, God, why in the world do you make us clean up our house first? I mean, why can't we just help someone else? And there are three reasons that God wants you to clean up your own house before you take and clean up someone else's. The first one is, it's your greatest platform. Your home is your greatest platform. What does it benefit Gideon to save a nation if he loses those closest to him? I mean, I know there's awards and sales goals and achievements, but what is all that going to matter if you lose your family? What is all that going to matter if, if one day you turn around with a wall full of trophies and you lost your family? It's your greatest platform. If there's any other group of people that should know God because you know God, it shouldn't be people all across the world. I love missions. It should be the people that you live with. You see, true success is having those who know you best respect you the most. That's what true success is. Those who know you best respect you the most. But not only is it his greatest platform, it's where the enemy attacks God's servants. 
It's absolutely, the family is where the enemy attacks God's servants. Why is that? Because it strikes at the core of our beliefs. God, I'm out here focused on your will. I'm praying, God, I'm giving, and look what happened. Nobody was watching over my family. We've all had those thoughts. God, every time I take a step towards you, it seems like something bad happens in my family. Not to mention that the enemy attacks here because it's the greatest distraction. I mean, I expect for things to go bad at work occasionally, but when things go bad at home, oh my goodness, it knocks the wind out of you. I mean, I expect these things to happen, but when they happen at home, it's just multiplied impact, and if I'm distracted, I'm not effective. And the enemy knows that. But then the third thing is, is that it will follow you into your destiny. I want to show you this. Look, I want you to see this. The arch enemy of the people of Israel that Gideon is a part of right now is the Midianites, right? These are terrible nomadic people who, who are trying to oppress Israelites. We talked a lot about that last week. There are a people who, who the Bible says that Israel describes them as a swarm of people. I mean, they're just an awful oppression. Did you know the Midianites were distant relatives of the Hebrews? They're distant relatives. You see, Gideon comes from the lineage of Abraham to Isaac. The Midianites come, is actually Isaac's half-brother who came through Abraham's um, concubine, Keturah. These are distant cousins that they're fighting against. If you don't think you'll deal with that stuff in your home, it's going to follow you. We're here seven, eight hundred years later, and guess who Gideon's facing? The same enemy that his great times ten grandfather didn't deal with. It's the exact same enemy. Generations of people have had to deal with what Abraham did not take care of in his own home. It's going to follow you. And here's the thing about the Midianites is they weren't these people who, who just came and oppressed and constant. They were people who only appeared at harvest. Remember, they only appear at harvest. So when people were expecting abundance, they received attack. Man, do you know that you are facing the Midianites when it comes out of nowhere? I mean, and family issues often come out of nowhere, don't they? I mean, we think it's fine. We think it's good. We think there's nothing going on, everything. And then all of a sudden, the whole, the wheels come off the thing and it's in the ditch. I mean, that's the way family crisis works. It's never this small thing. It's always a gigantic blow up. And it never is anything we expect. We expect the stuff at work. We don't expect it here. But that's not only it. It, it. The Bible tells us that the Midianites only came at a time after the Israelites had recovered. Man, it just feels like every time I get my head above water, that's when that issue resurfaces, doesn't it? I mean, isn't it with our families? You cannot put a crisis to bed with one family meeting. It is constantly happening, constantly coming back. It's just like this. And so Gideon here is dealing with something that somebody didn't deal with in their own home many, many, many years ago. And so Gideon does two things that are very important that you and I have to do to make sure this doesn't happen in our own lives, these small things, because Gideon is starting to do some small things that are leading to big change. And, and the first one is you have to lead where you are. You see, Gideon, it says, so Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. Gideon did not send 10 of his servants. He led 10 of his servants. You see, this is very important because Gideon is starting to change from God changed them to God changed me. And if you want to see renewal in your house, if you want to see renewal in your marriage, with your kids, or anything else, it would be my suggestion to you that you spend more time praying for yourself than you do praying for them. Because that's the way renewal in family works. Renewal in family works when you yourself are renewed. Renewal in family works, Gideon, when the idols that you've tolerated in your life are removed first before you start trying to remove the idols in other people's lives. So Gideon knows he has to lead where he are, but that's not all he does. He worships where he is. You know what I love about God? Now, we don't make him out to be this way, but th this is the truth of how he is. We see God as only caring about what we deconstruct in our lives. 
But God tells Gideon to deconstruct something, but to construct something else. You see, we think faith is only about what we have to deconstruct. It's a list of do's and don'ts, right? I mean, when I become a Christian, I can't, and I, don't, I can't anymore, and God cares if I, and, and all, all this stuff, and, and, and it's just this, we think, you know, when I get my certified I'm saved card, it comes with a long list that says of things that I can't do. God doesn't work that way. God says that you're going to deconstruct the bad things in your life, Gideon, but I want you to construct an altar to me. I want you to construct some good things in your life. And what we find is it's not an exchange of a list of do's and don'ts, but instead God gives us an opportunity to know him in the fullest measure, to know him in the best life. As a matter of fact, he said, I'll give it to you in a life that's more abundant than you can even imagine. It's not just about what you have to get rid of in your life. It's about what is God building back in your life in this moment. And so Gideon builds this altar, and this is why this is important. You can't have courage or clarity in your life for your destiny without worship. You can't expect to know what God wants for your life if you're not in his presence. You can't expect to have courage to face the things that are in your life without being in his presence. The clarity and courage you need for everyday life is found through worshiping God in his presence. But, but not only that, it, it's about inserting because people who regularly Spend time with God. See God inhabit the circumstances of their lives. Yeah, I asked a marriage counselor one time, I said, you know, what does it take to have a great marriage? And I expected this big, big answer, you know, like, well, you've got to read together for two hours every night, or you have to look at each other in the eyes and recite poetry, or, you know, I mean, whatever it is, you know, you expect this giant commitment, and, they, and without hesitation, you know what he said? Pray together daily. Pray together daily. And he said, here's why. Because if you pray with them, you have to talk. And if you pray with them, you have to have some measure of care. And it's tough to pray with somebody you hate. And so ultimately, a small prayer daily will transform your marriage. You know what that means? It means that if you will start to put God in your home, you're not going to have to deconstruct bad things. He'll take care of that in his presence because you're constructing good things in your marriage and in your family and in your home. I know for many of us, we feel like our family is too messed up for God to do anything in, but I want you to know that God not only has a plan of salvation for you, he's got one for your whole family, and he wants to see you prioritize and lead and worship in that, and then his Holy Spirit will take care of the rest of it. All of a sudden, a family that's filled with strife and a home that's filled with all these issues, if you start carrying your own, you, you start getting rid of the own idols in your life and start carrying his presence in your own life, all of a sudden, you're going to find peace becomes the norm in your family. You're going to find that all those things start to transform simply by inserting him into the circumstances of your life. I mean, how awful is it that we continue in life week in, week out, and we say, God, where are you? The whole time he's given us the key to invite him into any circumstance, which is through worship, and we just forget about it. You see, we have to take the time to prioritize his presence, not in our homes, but in us. And our homes will be a byproduct of that. But not only does he lead where he is and he worships where he is, but then Gideon has a moment like we do. And God assures us where we are. You see, Gideon, if you read this passage of Scripture, it says he's doing all these things we're talking about, but then, but because he was afraid and his fam, of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than daytime. And there's the Gideon we know. It? And that's the one we talked about last week. I mean, I'm doing it, God, but I'll just do it this way so that it's not as noticeable, or I'll do it this way. You know, here's the Gideon. You see, once we take a step of faith, expect buyer's remorse, right? I mean, you're going to want to hit that alarm clock when you took the step of faith to start inserting God to your mornings. I mean, I was thinking yesterday, you know what I prayed against yesterday? The Saturday sickness. Do you know what that is? Strange virus. Hits people on Saturday nights and is gone by Sunday afternoons, but typically keeps them from doing anything on Sunday mornings. It's a very, very strange disease. I prayed against that yesterday. So for you, I prayed alarm clocks would work yesterday. I, I did because we have to have assurance. 
Gideon could not take more than one step, with, or more than two steps without one of them being reluctant. He couldn't. And, and, and in this, we like Gideon need repeated assurance in our life as we're following God's plan. I mean, we have to have this. Gideon, in his story, he needs God to, to send fire down and take up an offering earlier. He's getting ready to have two episodes with fleeces where he says, well, God, if you'll make this one wet, then, then um, we'll, you know, I'll believe you. Well, God, one more time, if, you, if you'll make this one wet or dry, now I'll, I'll believe you. And then later he has to have a dream just to complete the one thing. that He has to have three confirmations for the one thing that God's told him to do. You know, we're just not that much different. I mean, how many times have you said to yourself, I'm never going back this time. I, from this day forward, I'm going to be like this. I mean, how many times ha have we done that and have, have we made the decision and we're going to and only to realize that our hearts are so very stubborn to living out God's promises. We really do struggle to trust him. And so they we're not that much different from Gideon. And many people have criticized Gideon for this. They've criticized him. They said, oh, you, you shouldn't pray for fleeces. There's actually two camps on this. They, you, you shouldn't pray for fleeces and these, these gods, if you will, then I will type things because that's a lack of faith. And then I hear other people say, well, you should, you should have these fleeces in your life. And if you'd want this. And, and what I found is there's extremes for both. And the truth of it is we criticize these guys. But think about if somebody was following you around, writing down all the dumb things you said and did. I mean, next time you go to criticize Moses, just think about that person who will follow you around and thinking about, you know, all the things you do and say and, and how we would look at them in light 2,000 years later. We should give these guys a little bit of slack. But it's funny because if it was a sin to do the fleece, then why did God entertain it? And if it's the way that God wants us to live life, why doesn't he mention it more than once? I mean, I know people that get up and, God, do you want me to get a job? And they're looking at a stack of bills. It's like, yes, God wants you to get a job. That stack of bills is your fleece. Go. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, that, that's really what we find is these people on these extremes. But here's what I think is true. And I really did study this out because I know this is an interesting part of his story. I don't think that fleeces and these moments that we see Gideon have are about Gideon at all. I don't think a fleece, a dream, or anything that Gideon asked for is about Gideon. I think it's a statement about God. You see, in this moment, Gideon needs three different times, three conversations, three confirmations that, God, do you want me to do this? And God, who is rich in his mercy and patience and kindness, entertains this from Gideon. You see, God is perfectly fine with our need for assurance. And it may lack faith or it may be a way to demonstrate faith. I don't know. But I know that God in his rich mercy continues to entertain someone who we would never entertain. It, it, it's so funny because three times he does this. But do you know how one of the ways God describes himself in Exodus 34 and 6, this is one of the ways. He says, slow to anger, great in power. Slow to anger, great in power. God's power is not only displayed in your life through demonstration, but also reservation. To have all the power that God has and to reserve it, to continue to allow us to try to match his speed. I mean, God, in all that he could do, because if you and I were God, we wouldn't have waited this long. Yet there's God in his patience. If you and I were God, we would have put away with this a long time ago. We wouldn't have dealt, we would have destroyed the world. But there's God who's carefully planning and plotting always to bring his people back to him. You see, for us, we don't even have enough patience to deal with ourselves we look in the mirror and give up each and every day, but right there and looking in the mirror is God faithfully believing in you. When every time that we feel like a situation's gone too long and it's been given too much grace, there's God long-suffering and generously continuing to wait on our ability to become a part of him. There is this constant just desire, such a heart that he has 
to be with you. That he's waited all history for it. That he literally has planned and plotted the family you were born into, the friends you have, the circumstances, the location that you today supply, that you despise. He has carefully and patiently, intentionally guided each of those steps because he will do anything and wait as long as it takes for you to be in relationship with him. That's how patient God is. That's how long-suffering, that when he can speed up all time, he won't because you're worth the wait. And then Gideon has this moment. I mean, he serves where he is, and he starts where he is, and he leads where he is, and he worships where he is, and God even is so gracious to assure him where he is. And then verse 34 comes out of nowhere. It says, now all the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the eastern peoples joined forces and crossed the Jordan. This, that means that everybody's getting ready to have a big old brawl. It's the Jets and Sharks. They've, they've all gotten their places. Gideon, in verse 34, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. Don't miss this. In spite of Gideon's location... Nothing has changed. Nothing about his location has changed. Nothing about what he's doing. Probably he's still smelling the smoke off of this burning sacrifice. And it seems as though out of nowhere, the Spirit of the Lord comes on Gideon in a mighty way. <laughs> What's funny is that the people, when, when, by the way, when God's Spirit comes on you, everybody can see it. They just see you walk different, you talk different. I mean, you just you walk with an, an empowering part. That, I mean, it's just different. And so everybody can notice this. And I would imagine that his family and his friends and the people in the village and even the enemy see this change in Gideon. And you know what they probably think? Well, that was just a cosmic lottery. He's just lucky. They probably think, well, I, you know, if I'd have been given those circumstances, I would have. But you know what? Gideon and God know that's not true. We know that's not true. Because there were a lot of small things that are getting ready to lead to the big destiny that Gideon's about to have. A lot of things nobody saw. And in your marriage, that you had to work very, very hard for. People think that's just easy. And in your career, that you've worked very hard for and been faithful in the small things, all that people see is the big things. And they think it's just some cosmic lottery. They just think that it's just one of these things that, you know, God just loves others more than he loves himself. And they don't see that you served where you are, and you worshiped where you are, and you led where you are, and you had to have God's assurance. They don't, they don't see all that. They just assume one day it just it snapped in place for you. And I know that it can appear that way. But I'm telling you, from this scripture, what we see is that Gideon is just doing all he can in the place that he doesn't care for. And one day, God breathes on it, and his life is completely different. I know exactly what this is like. I, I was speaking at a conference uh, not that long ago. And when you go to these conferences, sometimes they have hosts. They're trying to be hospitable, and so they have hosts that will, you know, let me carry this for you. Let me get you some water, anything you need. And at this particular conference, there was a, a, a young man who was with me, probably late teens, early 20s, and he was suited up. And, and I mean, he just he was trying to be in that moment everything he could be. And you could just tell he had such a zeal to be used by God. And, and so, he would, he would ask me every 10 minutes, is there anything I need? And I'm just, you know, for me, it's I'm good. I can carry my own water and do all those things. But, you know, I, I appreciated what he was doing, and he just kept asking. And then I just, I, honestly, I wasn't thinking that much about it. I was trying to study on what I had to talk about in a few minutes. And as we were walking down the hallway, all of a sudden I felt like the Spirit of the Lord just, just kind of sucker punched me. And, and I turned around to that boy, and I said, I want you to know that it wasn't that long ago that I was doing what you're doing. And nobody noticed me. 
And I would lock the church and unlock the church and stack chairs and unstack chairs. And I would clean up places that I didn't mess up. And I would serve and get water bottles and change the batteries and mics. And I would do anything I could. And I want you to know that that's why I'm getting ready to step on this platform today. And I want you to know that it wasn't that long ago. And if you will do this faithfully, God will give you the destiny you desire in your life. Because that's so true in our lives. As, as Rory comes to the piano, it's so true that everybody else thinks this stuff just happens. They just think it snaps into place. But I'm telling you today, the things that you want to see happen in your big destiny are tied to the small steps that you need to take in your life today. The big destiny that God does absolutely 100% have for you, and it is grander than you could have ever imagined. It is bigger than you could ever dream because he says he does exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask, dream, or imagine. It's bigger than you could ever believe. Because of that destiny, you have to be so diligent to serve where you are today, to lead where you are, to make sure the idols in your own life are gone, to worship where you are, and to do the things because those are the things that man ignores but God completely watches for. I want you to stand to your feet. Gideon's getting ready to step into one of the greatest callings of his life. And it had nothing to do with anything other than he was faithful with the small things that God gave him. You know, the other side of God being so patient is that he will wait as long as it takes for us to become who he needs us to become before he'll give us our destiny. He's so patient that not only does he, he care for our weakness, but he makes sure that we're doing the things that he's asked for us to do before he takes us into his destiny. I heard one preacher put it this time. He said, God doesn't graduate you to the next grade until you pass the test. Here's the truth. I know you may hate where you're at right now. You may hate the location of your marriage. You may hate the location of your career. I know that you may hate the location of where you're at in life. And every prayer you pray is about, God, get me out of here. But don't be so quick to pray that because here has everything to do with where you'll be. The way you worship, the way you serve, the way you lead, here has everything to do with where God wants to take you. So my prayer for you is strength and self-awareness that the Holy Spirit would quicken you to see the opportunities that are before you that don't appear like opportunities to someone else. But if you are faithful, God is faithful. Father, I pray right now for people who struggle with where they're at. God, location can wear us out. And I know there are people here who have desperate needs of a change. But God, you did not anoint Gideon because he won some lucky just sweepstakes of faith. God, you saw in him a heart for you and a location he despised. So I pray right now strength into their lives. God, strength that would let them go back to the job they hate. Strength that would let them serve at that job with the spirit of excellence. God, strength to let them go back to a relationship and to, to, to stop focusing on the other person, but God, to say, Lord, what do you need to do in me? God, I know how hard it is to apologize. I know how hard it is to forgive, but your grace is sufficient. So, Lord, I just pray that people would sense today the sufficiency of your grace. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I didn't even realize God had a big destiny for my life. As a matter of fact, I hate my location and I don't see it changing because I, I don't have any clue where God wants me to be. If you're not in relationship with Christ, if you're not following him and his teachings and you're not following his life, I, I want to pray for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to be able to have this moment. If you 
want to follow Jesus. If you want to believe how he teaches us to believe, if you want to live the way he teaches us to live, and if you want the big destiny that he has for you, in spite of the location that you're in, no one's looking around. I want you to stick your hand up. I want to pray for you. I want to see who I'm praying for. I want you to stick your hand up. I see hands. I see hands. Keep them up. Keep them up. I just want you to keep it up. I'm going to pray for you. Father, right now, you see their willing hearts. You see their acknowledgement to desire for you. I pray right now that they would become followers of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you would teach them your ways and show them your paths. You say that, God, you order the steps of the righteous, and because they in this moment are righteous because of your work, God, I pray that you would begin to order their steps. I pray that your destiny for them would come alive. I pray that, God, shame and guilt would fade away right now and be replaced by love and forgiveness. God, we have all fallen short of your standard, God, but your patience and guidance, your your kindness is so great. So, Lord, I pray that you would extend it to them right now. I pray, God, that you would give them the strength to serve where you have them, to love where you have them, teach them to worship where you have them. Father, I pray that they would take steps to know you more, to be in your word, and to, 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 to converse with you daily in prayer. In Jesus' name we prayed. Amen. Will you welcome these who have just come in following Christ? If that was you, there's one more thing I want to tell you. There's a card in front of you that says prayer card. I want you to to, to mark on there that you accepted Christ or began to follow Christ today because we want to help you in this journey. You need people to help you in this journey. So I want you to fill that out. Leave it on a seat. Drop it at Connect Central in the lobby, the, the, the area. Whatever you need to do, I just want you to be able, because I want to continue to pray for you this week. We want to continue to reach out to you and help you become and to take steps into that destiny that God has for us. That card's in front of you. As our elders come forward right now, here's what I want to tell you. God has a destiny for your life. And in spite of the location that you may despise right now, he's going to give you the strength. And he's so patient and so loving that he cannot wait to see who you become. If you, if today sparked in your heart, and you just believe, God, you do have that destiny, and I do need strength for where you're taking me to serve where I'm at, to do what you've asked me to do. I want you to come and let one of these men and women of God, these people who pray for you regularly, to pray with you about that location. But I'm telling you, your season is not that far. If you'll be faithful in this moment, I promise you, you will see God's greatest and his best in your life. Do it in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this message was an encouragement to you to live a life fully devoted to God. For more information about Twin Rivers Worship Center, or if you would like to partner with this church's ministry in St. Louis, Missouri and around the world by giving, visit us at our website at trwc.com. We would love for you to join us in a worship service at one of our two locations sometime. Have a great day and be blessed.